Thank you. 
Well, good morning and welcome to worship at University Christian Church in Fort Worth, Texas. My name is Russ Peterman. I am the senior minister here, and it is my deep joy and my great privilege to welcome you today. 
Today you may notice that we're in a slightly different space. Today we are celebrating Higher Education Sunday, that one Sunday every November when we recognize our heritage and celebrate our partnership uh, with Texas Christian University and Bright Divinity School. So today we are at the Robert Carr Chapel on the campus of Texas Christian University where we will be bringing you worship today. I want to invite you before we begin to take just a moment and go to our website if you're not there already and to register your attendance, whether you're a longtime member or just passing by. We want to know that you were with us, and so please go. You will find a tab there to register your attendance. You will also find a place to share with us any joys and concerns, any prayer requests that you may have, as well as download the worship bulletin for today, as well as share your gifts of tithes and offerings. Church, it is good for us to be together even in this unique space as we worship together and celebrate who we are and our heritage of where we've come. Hear now this call to worship. Open our minds, Lord, so that we may hear the joy that you have said to us today. Open our hearts, Lord, so that we may feel the compassion that you feel. Open our hands, Lord, so that we may transform the world by living out Christ's courageous love. Let us worship God together.
Good morning, everyone at UCC. I'm sorry we couldn't all be together in person, but I just wanted to bring greetings on behalf of Texas Christian University and say that I hope everyone has a blessed Sunday. Thanks for having me as part of the celebration. Good morning. On this Higher Education Sunday, I bring greetings on behalf of Bright Divinity School. Though for me, as a member of this congregation, every Sunday honors higher education. I hear a timely sermon that speaks to both heart and mind. Indeed, I have recommended our online services to uh, uh, other academicians across the country. Uh, last Sunday, I received a message from a professor in the Northeast thanking me for that recommendation stating that Russ Peterman, quote, not only included the election in his lesson, he asked us to choose faith over fear. It was a brilliant and inspired message, unquote. Every Sunday, I see Wright Divinity School students helping to lead worship. This reflects the congregation's partnership with Bright in equipping leaders for church and world. And then there is that series of lectures and sermons that we call Minister's Week. This year, Minister's Week will be online. But for more than 80 years, this congregation has hosted this remarkable educational event. 19th century disciples leader Alexander Campbell argued that colleges and churches go hand in hand in the progress of transforming this world. That's a message that this congregation has embraced. Thank you, church, for being who you are. As I invite you to join me in a spirit of prayer this morning, I want to remind you that you can submit a prayer request both online and through our dedicated prayer line. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. God of love and wonder, we come to you this morning in awe of your creation. As we watch leaves turn from green to gentle hues of orange and yellow, we feel your peace. As we watch clouds travel through blue skies, we feel your comfort. Holy creator of magnificent mountains and breathtaking views, we praise you. We thank you for this wonderful earth on which we live, and we thank you for one another. As we hear the laughter of children, we remember your joy and youthfulness. As we hear the passing cars and barking dogs, we remember your constant presence. Holy creator of such wonderful moments, we praise you. God that fills our lives, we ask that your guiding hand leads us to comfort one another during this season. As we smell the pumpkin pie that reminds us of lost loved ones, and as we begin the never-ending process of preparing our homes for upcoming holidays. God of love and wonder, we ask that you remind us to care for one another as we learn new ways to celebrate. May we remember that you created all things in your image, and that we are called to live into your love, grace, compassion, and mercy. We ask these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So our text today comes from Luke's Gospel. Although the encounter is also recorded in both Matthew and Mark's version of the story, it's the story of a lawyer 
an expert in the law who was trying to trip up Jesus. And he asked him a question, what is the greatest of all the commandments? Now, that's a fascinating question because there are 613 commandments in the Hebrew Scriptures. How could you possibly whittle them all down, summarize all 613? How could you identify one as being more important than all the others? But Jesus isn't shy. He's not tentative. He's not even hesitant. Instead, He sums it up in a way that is so insightful as to who God is and how we are to live as God's people. If you were to ask, what is the entire message of the Bible, the overarching narrative, I would say it's simply this, that God loves us, and that the way that we respond to that, the way that we live our lives, is how we love God back. We live this way not in order to to earn God's love. It's not a, a checklist to get God to love us. But in gratitude, in recognition, in response to that divine love, we are to love God with the three parts of who we are. Our head, our heart, and our hands. Today's scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. Here begins the reading. A teacher of the law came up and tried to trap Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to receive eternal life? Jesus answered him, what do the scriptures say? How do you interpret them? The man answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You are right, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. This is the word of God for the people of God. Some of you know that our denomination, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, began as two groups in the early 1800s. One group was led by Barton W. Stone, and they simply called themselves Christian. It was a nod to their emphasis on unity. They focused on the experience of God. Being a person of faith was was not just believing in the right doctrines. It was not just about living a moral life. It was about experiencing the love and the grace of God. Now, keep in mind that this was in the shadow of the Enlightenment, the intellectual and philosophical movement that dominated the world during the 18th century. Many historians and scholars refer to that time as the century of philosophy. And Stone argued that that the religious life was about more than just what went on in one's head. It was also about what was going on in one's heart. Stone's people believed that unity was more important than uniformity. That what mattered more than the beliefs you held in your head was the love that you held in your heart. That as Christians, we were to bear with one another despite our differences, any differences that we might have in terms of our doctrine. Now, the other group was led by a father-son duo by the name of Thomas and Alexander Campbell. They were Presbyterian ministers, and, and for them, unity was also central to what it means to be a person of faith. In fact, they got in trouble for offering communion the Lord's Supper to non-Presbyterians, which was a huge no-no at that time. They just welcomed everyone to the table, and as a result of that, they were kicked out of the Presbyterian church. The Campbells, though, they believed that thought was central, that they were intellectuals. They, They once said that a week's worth of debate was worth a year's worth of preaching. You see, whereas for Stone, it was about what was on in your heart, for the Campbells, it was more about the head. When these two groups met in 1824, there were significant differences in their theology, in their understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. But nothing would prevent them, the historians say, from joining together. 
Because both of them agreed that, that no opinion, no creed, no doctrine was more important than one's obedience to the commands of Jesus, most essentially the one that insisted that Christians be one just as Jesus and God were one. And so these two groups worshipped together, as the historians say, with one spirit and with one accord. They believed that while followers of Christ may never be united in their opinions, they must always be united in faith. That faith is the experience of the head and the heart and to be lived out in the work of our hands. Now, as this movement began to grow, they quickly realized that a key element of the growth and the sustainability of this movement was the establishment of schools. And so in 1836, they began Beacon College in Georgetown, Kentucky. And just a few years later, Bethany College in what is now West Virginia. And by the start of the Civil War, they had launched 16 colleges, which unfortunately was more than they could sustain, and so many of them wilted just as quickly as they blossomed. But that didn't stop them from creating new colleges and universities. And in 1873, in Thorpe Spring, Texas, a stagecoach stop on the cattle frontier, just about 40 miles from where we are. On the first Monday in September, two brothers, Addison and Randolph Clark, with help from their father, Joseph, both of whom were preachers in the Stone Campbell movement, opened the doors to Adran, Addison and Randolph, Adran Male and Female College. They had 13 students that first year. Within five years, the enrollment swelled to 450 students, and the Clarks and their spouses sold everything that they owned in order to invest in a larger building. But for the college to continue, they quickly discovered an endowment would be needed. And so the Clarks forged an affiliation with the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, the Barton Stone Movement, to adopt their school, giving it a new name and ensuring its future. In 1895, they decided to say goodbye to Thorpe Spring and move the school to Waco just a few miles from Baylor University. In 1898, the school's first yearbook was named the Horn Frog, after the small but fierce lizard that was embraced as the school mascot. Football had started just the year before, and the field was covered, legend has it, with the small but mighty horned lizards, and it seemed a perfect match. Students were asked and invited to choose the school colors, and they chose purple and white, purple for royalty, white for a clean game. And they officially became Texas Christian University in 1902. Now, in both Thorpe Spring and in Waco, they were on the outskirts of town, too far for students and faculty to get to the church that was downtown. And so the school formed a university church that would meet in the chapel. And they called themselves simply University Christian Church. Addison and Randolph Clark were both excellent ministers, and pretty soon people from around the community started coming. And so it was uh, the town and the gown, as they say, were one church that met in the college chapel. Now, some of you may know what happened next. In 1910, there was a mysterious fire that destroyed the campus in Waco, and TCU moved to right here in Fort Worth. Now, while many Texas towns courted the trustees hoping to get TCU to come to their school, or to their town, no one desired a university more than the city leaders of Fort Worth, who understood and felt that a, a college might help soften their rowdy reputation as Cowtown, a home of <clears throat> Hell's Half Acre, where the cattle industry and the pending new railroad 
had created a boisterous and rowdy culture. Well, the university church would continue to meet on campus and would officially become a congregation in 1917 while continuing to meet here until the building could be built starting in 1933. Now, over the years, TCU and UCC and later what would become Bright Divinity School have enjoyed a a strong, positive relationship, a partnership where both the, the university, the Divinity School, and our congregation was served well. In many ways, TCU and Bright are the flagship schools of disciples, colleges, and seminaries. And in the same way, UCC is one of the flagship congregations in our denomination. Since the early days, the school and the church have bound together. We have pushed and supported one another. We have been partners in challenging conversations about what it means, what it means to be faithful, about what an informed faith looks like, what an integrated faith looks like, one that involves both what Campbell thought was important in the head and stone in the heart. Dr. Bill Tucker, who was a, is a member of this congregation, the Chancellor Emeritus at TCU, a disciples minister and a church historian who literally wrote the book, or at least one of them, on the history of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ. In an article that he wrote in 2001 for the TCU magazine, he pointed out, that the thought and practice of disciples serve TCU well. Emphasizing the reasonableness of faith, disciples believe in God with the top of their minds as well as the bottom of their hearts. Inclusive in spirit, they are best known for their defining interest in the cause of Christian unity. And in the same way, UCC is a congregation that fits well with the university. We have always been a church that values both the head and the heart, not just one or the other, but both. We, too, are forward-thinking, curious about matters of faith and life. We have been on the forefront of issues like the involvement of women in leadership, inclusion, civil rights, the use of the Bible as a tool to inform our faith, and the relationship with our brothers and sisters, whether or not they agree or share our beliefs. As a university Christian church, our DNA is to be a church of thinking people, people who have questions, people who have doubts, a place where we don't expect people to check their brain at the door. We want you to bring your questions. We want you to bring your doubts. The truth is that we all have struggles, we all have doubts, and this is a place, this is a congregation where we ask those questions. It's a place for us to wrestle together as we try to figure out the truth, to understand who God is, who Jesus is, about what He means for us and how we are meant to live out our faith. Recently, we identified curiosity as one of our core values as a congregation, And we did that because we don't pretend to have all the answers, nor do we shy away from asking the big questions about who God is and what God is calling us to do with our life. You see, our call as a university church is to inspire, to encourage, to to equip people to be deeply committed Christians to help one another in our faith, to live out our faith, to be a place where we love God with our head and our heart and our hands, where we wrestle with what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves, where we empower and encourage one another to live out our faith, for all of us to become deeply committed Christians, fully surrendered to God. You see, as a university church. We strive to be a people who love God with our head, with our intellect, our thoughts, our imagination, our reasoning, our curiosity, our convictions, our conscience, where we devote our minds to learning about God, about God's world, and to love God with that knowledge that we gain. 
We are a people, too, who love God with our heart and our soul. That emotional part of us, our feelings, our emotions, our intuition, our character, our will, our desire, our passions. We are a people who love God with all of our strength, with our actions, our bodies, our energies. You see, we are a gathered people who seek to embrace and live out a life of faith with our head, with our heart, with our hands. We recognize that each are equally important, that that when we love God with only one aspect of who we are, of who God made us to be, then our lives become fragmented in conflict with how God made us to be and how God calls us to live. What must I do, the man said, in order to inherit eternal life? And Jesus put the question back on him. What do you think? How do you read Scripture? The man thought for a moment and said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus simply looked at him and said, That's a good answer. Do that. And live the life that has been entrusted to you. Amen. Come, I lay my truth, my life, such a I invite you to share the peace of Christ with those around you this morning. You can do this by sharing the peace with your loved ones in your living room, or by sending a text, an email, or sharing a phone call. The peace of the Lord be with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. 
May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Hi, my name is Nancy Brink. I'm Director of Church Relations at Chapman University, your disciple school in Orange, California. I am so happy to talk to you today about the Thanksgiving offering because these offerings go directly 100% to all of our 14 colleges and our seminaries to support students as they learn. Here at Chapman, we support students from all across the country who want to grow not only intellectually, but also spiritually in their time at Chapman. Here we teach them leadership skills and walk with them through their budding grown-up questions about faith and life and their sense of calling. Thank you for coming alongside us for so many years. I know these are difficult times during COVID, and so I'm particularly grateful for those of you who are able to support us with the Thanksgiving offering. My prayers for you is that you and your church continue to flourish, even as you help our ministry here flourish with love. My name is Dylan Wiley, and I am a freshman at TCU. I am in the Higher Education Leadership Ministries program, and this past weekend I had my very first retreat. Although it was virtual, uh, it was very heartwarming to be surrounded by a loving atmosphere of like-minded peers. I come from a smaller disciples church, and I had never really truly experienced what it was like to be in a community with that many disciples that were all my same age and all shared hopes and dreams of helping shape the church in a positive way. It was a truly impactful weekend, and I can only imagine what this program will be like once I am in person with all of these amazing people. This program also comes with a scholarship and helps me to live out my lifelong dream of attending TCU. It is programs like these that have created the opportunity for many students like me to grow within the Disciples Church. My peers and I are grateful for the support from congregations like UCC that helps to make these programs possible. If you would like your offering to go specifically to higher education's leadership ministries, then you can indicate that through your online giving. Thank you for your generosity. My freshman year of college, I took a psychology class where we got to see experiments done on baby Reese's monkeys to see what would create the best well-adjusted adult monkey. And now this experiment took two groups. One was given a warm, safe place with um, a food source, and the other were given just a feeding tube that they would go to for food. And what they found was that the monkeys with the warm, safe space would use it as sort of a base camp to then go off and explore their surroundings. And as these monkeys got older, they were the better, well-adjusted, more social animals. Now this other group, unfortunately, that just had the cold, more, less inviting space where the food was, they didn't explore as much. They stayed huddled around the food and huddled together. And as these monkeys grew, they were less adjusted, they were less social with their peers. Now, one of the biggest decisions that many students going into college face is whether they're going to go to college close to home or far away. And in my experience, what I've seen is that 
whether close or far, isn't the biggest outcome on their college experience or how well adjusted they are for college or the world afterwards. What matters is that they have a safe space at college. For many students, especially our disciples, the communion table is that safe space. It's that space where they can come back to each week or once a month, twice, whenever, and they know that there will be bread and there will be juice and there will be people that love them and support them. So for many students, this table is a safe space where they can explore from. This table is a space where we remember that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks for it, blessed it, and broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. And in a like manner, he took the cup, blessed it, poured it, saying, this is the blood of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim my life and love until I come again. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this awesome fall season that's upon us. Pray that the weather stays super nice and we can remember to count our blessings for towards this Thanksgiving. Uh, thank you for your son's ultimate sacrifice and his body that was broken, his blood that was shed for us, and prayers that the bread in our cup can give us renewance, and we thank you for your son's sacrifice and everything he's done for us, and in your name, amen. The body broken for you. The cup of hope poured out for you. I want to thank you again for joining us for Higher Education Sunday as we recognize and celebrate our connection, our relationship, our heritage with Texas Christian University and Bright Divinity School. And now, church, let us go out into the world and love God with our head, with our heart, with our hands. And let us transform the world by living out Christ's courageous love. And as we do, may God bless us and keep us. May God's face continue to shine upon us and make us one. Amen.